Hello everyone, welcome to our last uh, talk of this quarter in the NLP seminar series. Uh, I'm very honored to introduce Sam Bowman. I think most of you know him. <laughs> uh, he is an assistant professor at NYU. Uh, he received his PhD in 2016. Uh, he's working on a lot of interesting work in modeling, evaluation metrics, and, and creating a lot of benchmark data sets for text understanding, sentence understanding, and even beyond. Uh, probably most of you know his uh, work on the NLI benchmark as well as glue and superglue. So, and I think he's gonna talk about superglue once we get the right. question. Perfect. All right, thanks so much for, for coming. Thanks for hosting me, excited to be here. Um, so, this talk is sort of oriented toward this goal that I see as the goal for a pretty big chunk of NLP research this days, these days. Let me try to distill this down. I think a lot of work is oriented toward trying to develop a general purpose neural network uh, encoder for text, which makes it possible to solve any new language understanding task using only enough training data to define the possible outputs. So in this view, the sort of goal, the, the purpose of training data in NLP, or at least labeled training data, is just to tell you what the task is. In other words, we're trying to develop neural network models that already understand English or already understand your target language when you start, when you, before you start building a system for your task of interest. And of course, I'm, I'm sort of interested in this question because of the Muppets. Um, sort of systems like Elmo and Bert and Roberta, these large-scale pre-trained language models or quasi-language models, um, have started to, to suggest that this, we, we might be able to get very, very close to this goal in the not-so-distant future. So this is what I'll be talking about. I'm um, gonna start with the Glue benchmark, which is our attempt to run sort of a shared task competition around this goal. Talk about what we learned after launching Glue and sort of what we did in our, in our reboot of it uh, this year called Super Glue. Um, talk a little bit about some analysis work trying to understand why these Muppet models are succeeding and I'll actually do some, some meta Bertology, some analysis, some analysis of analysis work. Um, and then I'll end, and this is the part I'm excited to give because I have no results in this last section, just wild speculation on sort of what's next for evaluation. Because we are, the conclusion of this is that we're in a very weird position as a field. So I'll jump in with Glue. Um, Glue, this is joint work with, um, with Omer, with um, Alex and Amanpreet at NYU, uh, with Julian here, um, and Felix Hill at DeepMind. Glue is an open-ended competition, basically a shared task without a deadline for work on general purpose sentence encoders. So it's meant to roughly capture the sort of sentence level version of that goal I laid out at the very beginning. So why, why did we think that a shared task like this is, is worthwhile or interesting? Um, we had our own reasons, but this is sort of the post hoc justification that I think is, is most convincing. It's increasingly common for researchers outside of NLP to evaluate new techniques on language understanding tasks. I think this is much more true in the last couple of years than it had been in the, in the preceding years. This can potentially be really useful to us, having lots and lots of researchers with potentially orthogonal areas of expertise sort of trying to show, give us new methods that work on our problems. But we're only gonna learn much, or at least we're only gonna have an easy time benefiting from this if this work is being evaluated on tasks that, are, that represent real open problems in NLP. And this often doesn't happen. It's sort of frustrated seeing papers with very interesting methods and that show convincing evaluations on game learning or computer vision. Um, and then the NLP part of the evaluation is, is on something that sort of feels like it's lost the interest of the field years ago, often for good reasons. So on this view, the goal of Glue is as sort of this, this service to sort of expert researchers who are not NLP experts. So we want to provide a set of tasks, metrics, baselines, and code that represent open problems of interest to researchers in NLU. And the idea is basically, it's never, it's never sort of safe science to just hill climb on a number. We wanna get as close as we can. We wanna say, all right, this is a number where if you can make it go up for a good reason, you understand why it's going up, that is the best evidence you can easily get that you are making progress towards something interesting. And we're just trying to sort of offer this as a service. We're not trying to enforce any particular experimental design. Um, making a convincing experiment is sort of up to the user. So sort of how did we flesh this out? Um, glue is essentially a thin wrapper um, around nine um, sentence understanding tasks. These are all sort of previously published data sets. Glue is not a data set, it's just this, this wrapper in this toolkit. Um, we tried to pick data sets that were unsolved, that seemed like they were still 
subject to subjects of active research in NLP um, that were as varied as possible in, in the amount of training data uh, that they used and that were as varied as possible in the style or genre of language that they used, at least subject to the constraint that the text, that the text be readable by maybe college-educated US, UK English speakers. And the hope was that by sort of picking a reasonably diverse set of tasks that fit these criteria, we'd be able to make the case that, okay, if you have a single recipe, a single model that can do well in all of these, that's evidence that you're, you're making progress on a somewhat more general problem. Uh, we imposed a couple of, of additional constraints. We wanted to use very simple task APIs. Uh, for, for the original Glue benchmark, we're focusing on sentence or sentence pair inputs and classification or regression outputs. Um, so we're not, we weren't including any tasks that require generation or, or any other kind of structured prediction. And the idea here was just, it seemed conceptually possible to isolate the thing we care about, isolate this sort of core learning of sort of syntactic, semantic, maybe pragmatic uh, processing of, of common sense that applies to NLU. We, we could isolate these skills using very, very simple task APIs, and that would make it easier to focus on the thing we care about, that, that in an ideal world, dealing with complex output spaces would just be a distraction. Not necessarily how it played out, but that was the idea. Um, we also put together a fairly simple leaderboard API. This is sort of a, a, a detail, but um, to get scores on this benchmark, you download unlabeled test data, you run your model on it, you upload the test data, and you get a score from our website, very much in the style of CAGOF Semival. Um, this means that we are not, we're not imposing any restraints on the kinds of software that people can use or the kinds of models that people can use. We don't care if people are doing multitask learning or pre-training or even using neural networks. The only bit of babysitting we're doing, the only thing we're enforcing is placing a hard limit on how often people can use the test set to make it, to, to basically sort of to try to earn the trust of the people who are giving us access to their private test data. Here's, um, here are the data sets we wound up with for, for again, the sort of first iteration of Glue. I'll go over this from a couple of different angles. So first looking at training set size, plotting this on a linear scale, we get a, a reasonably wide range. For the Quora question pairs and multi-genre NLI data, we've got close to a half a million examples. I think this is sort of toward the high end of what you might realistically see doing NLU work. And at the low end, um, we've got one task, this um, NLI format Winograd data set with under 1,000. Um, four of these test sets in bold um, use private data. Um, the, the full labeled test sets have never been published. That helps us gain some degree of trust that these these test numbers are, are mean, what, mean what they're supposed to mean. And then looking at domain, we have uh, single genre tasks using Quora data. This is sort of community question answering, social media question answering, fiction books, Wikipedia. And then several of these miscellaneous or multi-domain uh, data sets include transcribed speech as well. We think reasonably broad range there. Give just a couple of examples of what these tasks um, look like. Um, COLA, this is one from, from our group at NYU is a binary classification task where you have to decide if a string of words forms a possible English sentence. This is sort of our most syntax or structure oriented task. It's an odd, it's an odd task because, um, uh, because we're, we're not allowing for any kind of structured prediction. So this is just this Boolean classification task. Um, you're asked to decide if a string is a valid sentence of English. So for example, you'll get examples like, um, who do you think that will question Seamus first? This is understandable, but if you're a native English speaker, you'll recognize that there's, there's really no reason that this word that should go there. This doesn't sound right. This isn't something you'd, you'd generally say, and so you'd mark that as, as unacceptable. And then we have a roughly equal number of contrasting sentences that are perfectly fine, like the second example here. And we think this is a, sort of an interesting, interesting task, an interesting data source, because Boolean judgments of these kinds are a major source of evidence in linguistic theory, especially for um, especially for a lot of work in syntax, this is the primary sort of gold standard form of evidence you could work with. And this allowed us to actually collect this corpus from published linguistics literature um, and build a data set that is, is comprised entirely of examples that uh, linguists thought were, were interesting and relevant to sort of key theoretical points. So interesting distribution of data. Um, one of our more semantics oriented tasks is the um, this combined data set from the RTE, Recognizing Textual Entailment Challenge Series. This is a binary classification task over sentence pairs. The task is to decide if one sentence entails another. If I tell you that this text is true, um, would you reasonably believe 
on that basis that this hypothesis is true. And here we get a, a, a no case, a negative example. And this is drawn from sort of these four, uh, four data sets from this competition series that was running in the late aughts. And it's relatively small, two and a half thousand examples for training. Uh, last one I want to highlight is um, our sort of glue variant of the Winograd schema challenge. Um, in the version that we're using here, it's a binary classification task on expert constructed pairs of sentences. You're trying to decide what an ambiguous pronoun refers to, uh, but these pairs were constructed such that there are sort of few usable statistical cues that will give you this answer, and, and it's meant to require you to do some fairly, fairly high level reasoning about the situation described. So if, um, if sort of Joan is the person receiving candy in this situation, that suggests that Joan rather than Jane is hungry. And so we get this entailment in this example. Um, and we got private test data uh, from the creators of this, um, the Winograd schema competition. So that's, that's my very brief overview of glue. Let me do the sort of boring but kind of inevitable thing and just run through what happened in the leaderboard, run through um, what we've learned just staring at the numbers uh, to start with. So um, I'll be showing just results on the single number glue benchmark score. Um, our bag of words model, this is we represent sentences as a sum of word embeddings, feed those into a lightweight neural network. That gets a little bit under 60 points. These points are sort of unitless nonsense. Um, this is the average of the nine task specific metrics for each of our nine tasks. We couldn't really think of a better way to design a metric than that, not even though it doesn't make any sense, but bear with me. So trivial baseline gets a little under 60 nonsense points. Um, we've got two sort of strong baselines, which really represent sort of where we were starting with for the competition. Um, this baseline involves us building a reasonably sophisticated neural network model for each of the nine tasks separately, tuning that model for each of the nine tasks separately, um, and training it on the task specific training data. So here we use word embeddings. We don't otherwise use any kind of pre-training or multitask learning. And this got about 66, 67 points. And this represented sort of pretty close to the state of the art on these tasks circa late 2017. Our other sort of serious baseline was uh, the best available sentence to vector model. This is from Subramani and Adal at Montreal. This is a model where you, you try to, you do some pre-training, you do some multitask learning, but ultimately your goal is to build a function that maps sentences to vectors where you're not intending to fine tune that function. You're just intended to get sentence embeddings that you can use for your task. And this doesn't, these baselines are roughly equivalent, which is a clue that we really have, hadn't been making progress toward our big goal up until this point. That our best available methods for sort of general purpose modeling or pre-trained modeling for NLU um, was really no better than what you're able to do without, without any of these tricks. Um, the first method that really got off the ground was ELMO that I'm sure many of you have seen um, very, or even worked on. Um, it's a sort of the, one of the first clear successes with training a large language model and using that in a component of a task specific neural network. Uh, this was concurrent with the development of Glue, and so we just kind of dropped it on the leaderboard ourselves as the, as the sort of real starting point. Then got a sort of rapid succession of other models showing up. Um, OpenAI sort of followed relatively soon after the launch of the competition with um, the first language model to use a transformer style neural network architecture and the first use fine tuning, where the idea here is you, um, um, to adapt this model to a specific task, you, um, you back, sort of back propagate into the pre-trained language model itself without adding any more parameters or layers than necessary. Um, this turned out to help quite a bit. Followed fairly quickly by Google's BERT, um, which replaces the classic left to right language modeling pre-training task with a, this modified mass language modeling setup and gets an even larger gain. So at this point, we were seeing what looked like accelerating progress. We didn't, we were sort of surprised to see how much mileage we were able to get out of more or less just language modeling and fine tuning. So we went back to do something we really should have done to begin with, which is uh, measure human performance. So we wanted to know how much headroom glue, glue had left. We wanted to know at, at what point are the scores getting so good that we should sort of abandon ship. We should say, all right, we've, we've, we've learned all we can learn from this benchmark. And there's no perfect way to, to, to measure this. You, you can't directly observe phase error. But we figured that doing a reasonably, um, trying to do a reasonably high quality human evaluation would give us some hints. So for each of the nine tasks, we train crowd workers on the task using both instructions and some actual interactive mode training data. 
And we got um, multiple labels for each test example we were using from multiple annotators, took a majority vote. Not a not the sort of absolute gold standard human evaluation, but should give us a reasonable clue of how well one can easily do on these tasks. And uh, few humans do significantly better than BERT. Um, I think about a five or six point difference over BERT. But then within a few weeks of us publishing this result, uh, Microsoft came out with a uh, BERT variant. This just changes how BERT is fine tuned that did slightly better than humans. So by our definition, uh, glue has about this much headroom. So this method um, added some information sharing across tasks. Um, your, your share, your, you do a phase of pre-training where you train on all nine tasks at once before you, you fork off into nine separate models. This turned out to help. And we've seen a little bit of, of somewhat more incre incremental progress since then. Roberta takes the, the base BERT model and trains it longer um, on more data, plus a couple of other small changes. Albert switches to a more efficient parameterization of the transformer that lets them train a sort of bigger, deeper model. And T5 gets, uh, from Google gets even larger um, and adds the, some use of labeled data, including translation data, during pre-training. And this is sort of, this is where we are with this benchmark now. Uh, we're still seeing some progress, but it seems like we're, we're getting some, some amount of leveling out. Uh, we're above human performance, so it's not clear how much room there, there really is to go on this benchmark. And um, sort of this situation, or at least the beginnings of this situation a, a few months ago, is what motivated us to put together a follow-up project called Superglue. So Superglue was um, joint work with all the same people behind Glue, plus um, Nikita Nangia and Yada Prisachatkin at NYU. With Superglue, we basically wanted to just rebuild Glue from scratch and do it better, make something a little bit harder, a little bit more persuasive. Um, I was talking to, to Emily a couple of hours ago and, and sort of had the realization that um, anytime I write a paper that, that gets some attention, I, I realize all the ways I wish I'd written the paper better, and then I go back and try to write that paper. So this is, this is sort of our version of this from, for Glue. Um, so one thing we did differently is we started for, with an open call for data set proposals. Uh, Glue, like a lot of shared tasks, was organized somewhat ad hoc. We picked tasks just based on what the organizers thought was fairly representative of this thread of NLU research. With Superglue, we, want, we wanted to say, all right, we're getting, some people are, are taking us as speaking for the NLU community, so let's actually try to make some attempt at, at doing that. We'd said, all right, we'll take any tasks that get submitted that sort of pass some filters. We got 30 or 40 candidates, depending on, um, depending on how you count examples we had to rule out for, for copyright reasons or sort of uh, technicalities. And we filtered those down by running a human evaluation and then uh, a BERT model evaluation on each of these tasks. And our intent was just to keep any task for which humans were doing significantly better than BERT. And that left us with eight tasks. I think this is actually the, the more striking result on Superglue than, than any of the results that actually showed up on the benchmark, is that the majority of tasks that sort of publishing NLP experts submitted to us as examples of hard open problems in language understanding, uh, BERT large, trained with the default hyperparameters was already basically at human performance. So it was, it was hard to find a sort of viable set of data sets to put together here. And to even get to, to a task, we actually had to uh, loosen some of our restrictions on what we would consider. So we, we moved from uh, sort of sentence level inputs to also allow paragraph or short dialogue inputs. And we slightly relaxed the set of, out, um, of output mechanisms we would allow. So we wound up with these, uh, these eight tasks. We kept in two of the tasks from Glue that had sort of survived, um, survived through the arrival of, um, of uh, Roberta and some of these newer models, um, including the RTE challenge set and the Winograd schema data. We're using a different format, but same basic setup. And um, looking at training data set size, I think this was a really obvious trend that the tasks that sort of survived um, survived through this filtering tended to be ones with relatively small training sets. For a quick visual comparison, here's this sort of linear scale plot of um, the data set sizes for glue. Here's the same plot for super glue. Um, we've got three tasks with under 1,000 examples, um, and all but one of them are under 10,000. So smaller data regimes. Zooming in on just a couple of examples of sort of how these tasks are distinctive. Uh, one of the ones we added was uh, the commitment bank. This is a, a textual entailment task, sort of roughly the same idea as the RTE task I presented earlier. 
But the inputs are somewhat longer and more complex. Here, the input is a short dialogue. Um, and the, this is targeting a sort of special case of textual entailment that's meant to be somewhat distinctive and potentially somewhat difficult, which are cases where the hypothesis sentence, the thing that you're wondering whether is true, is more or less verbatim extracted from the source text. So here, the source text contains the phrase, what do you think? Do you think we're setting a trend? And the hypothesis is they're setting a trend. And the idea is this data set is meant to be balanced so that in about half of the examples, um, for one reason or another, because of questions or hedging or attribution of beliefs to others, um, the, this text does not, uh, does not actually imply the clause that, that it literally contains. And so this is both sort of an interesting, weird, special case of entailment and a fairly small data set with only 250 training examples. One more example um, of, of a task, we, we included multi-RC. This is one of the many um, sort of multiple choice reading comprehension data sets to come out recently. It's one that's proven to be relatively hard. Um, the inputs are paragraphs um, rather than sentences. And, and we're asking relatively straightforward factoid questions about what the paragraph as a whole uh, is conveying. And this is also relatively small with about 5,000 examples. So that's that's quick overview of superglue. Let me again do the boring leaderboard thing, and then we can start talking about some more fun stuff. So our um, bag of words baseline was fairly low, again in the high 40s. Um, BERT by design didn't didn't uh, perform that well. We're getting sort of 68 or 69 unitless points for BERT. What was striking though is that Roberta did quite a bit better. I believe about 15 points better. Um, which is a much larger gain that we'd gotten from BERT to Roberta, which is again the same model, just trained on, trained on more data. We got a much smaller gain on the original GLUE benchmark. So I think what this is suggesting is that we, we explicitly filtered out data sets for which um, BERT was doing well. But many of these remaining data sets for which BERT was doing poorly, it doesn't seem like BERT was doing poorly for a particularly deep reason, that just kind of doing a little, bit more, a little bit more tuning, a little bit more refinement on the same basic idea, the same basic model, was able to recover a lot of that, um, recover a lot of that lost performance, if that makes sense. Current state of the art is Google's T5, a few points higher, which is one point behind human crowd workers. So superglue is pretty close to being saturated, at least by our rough estimate of an upper bound. So, um, I'm going to be bouncing around for the rest of the talk, sort of trying to make, uh, make, uh, make sense of where this leaves us. But let me um, start by just giving some, some caveats to my sales pitch about superglue. I, I still think that glue and superglue are interesting, informative, useful metrics, but with a couple of caveats. Um, so glue and superglue are built only on English. Um, we're deliberately targeting sort of the, the easiest, highest resource um, cases of language understanding tasks that seem realistic to us. Um, we're focusing on English, dealing with lower resource languages, or even just languages that are not quite as international and weird would likely be harder and somewhat different. Um, more importantly, glue and superglue use lots of naturally occurring or crowdsourced data. Um, most of the text is either extracted from uh, a web source like Wikipedia or written by crowd workers. What this means is that as with really most sources of text you can find, they're going to contain evidence of social bias, that, um, that the word nurse will show up with female names and pronouns much more often than male names and pronouns, that uh, African American names will show up uh, in more negative sentiment contexts than European American names. These are, just, these are just sort of facts about the text we have access to. Because we're using this data in an evaluation benchmark, um, all else being equal, models that learn and use these biases will do better on these benchmarks. And this, I sort of, I'm not sure we even need that much quantitative evidence that this is happening, but we have some. Uh, in Superglue, we included one little targeted evaluation um, as one of our auxiliary tasks. So this is a task that we deliberately didn't count toward the main score, but that we still required users to submit. Um, this is a sort of special case of textual entailment. Um, where you have these sort of gender balance examples, where you have uh, any time you have a reference to, any time you have a gendered pronoun in an example, you'll have a mirrored example with the opposite pronoun or, and, and adjusted names. And what we found is that the T5, the current state of the art, 
is 10 times more likely to be thrown off by irrelevant gender information than humans. This is sort of an odd metric, but it's, it's the best thing we had access to. Essentially means that if a model gets an example right, um, where, for example, uh, nurse co-refers with a, a female name, uh, it's pretty likely to get that example wrong when you make the sort of counter stereotypical switch and um, make the sentence refer to a male nurse. The model is likely to sort of lose the thread of what's being talked about. And this is just sort of a big, awkward, open problem in pretty much just large-scale machine learning in general. Um, we don't have any sort of easy, reliable, politically neutral recipe for mitigating these biases and even measuring them, measuring them well in a, task, in a way that's relevant to the task you're trying to build can be somewhat difficult. So this is just a thing to watch out for with this kind of work. Um, and just flagging sort of one more non-limitation, but uh, point that bears mentioning, um, we again, we built, uh, we built both of these benchmarks around these maximally simple, um, maximally simple outputs based tasks, these classification or prediction or multiple choice tasks. I still think that this is a, this is a reasonable way to go about working on language understanding, but this also means that we did rule out, um, we did rule out a lot of tasks that are, that are represent difficult problems in language understanding uh, in a number of ways. So sort of where does this leave us? Um, we, we're, we're more or less at human performance on both of these benchmarks. We clearly haven't solved language understanding. Um, to, to give one of many, many, many different kinds of evidence I could give for this claim, um, we included another diagnostic task uh, sort of attached to superglue that um, are relatively straightforward examples. Nothing, nothing really tricky, but just trying to isolate a bunch of different kinds of reasoning or a bunch of different phenomena that might come up in, in text understanding. One example of this, this is from, uh, from Julian, are, is this simple pair of examples showing that if you ate pizza with olives, you ate the olives. If you ate pizza with friends, you didn't eat the friends. And um, state-of-the-art models do pretty well on these diagnostics. Um, these are, definitely aren't highlighting sort of massive gaping failures in reasoning. But um, on examples like this that are still pretty straightforward, uh, we do see a 10-point gap between the state-of-the-art models and, and humans. So one, so one of many kinds of evidence that we're sort of not there yet, that our main benchmark isn't testing everything we might want it to test. And this is a, a trickier point to make and one that I'm, I'm a little less confident about asserting. But it really doesn't seem like we've sort of solved language understanding, even if you focus on IID evaluations for these simple classification-based based problems. I'm not willing to accept that we've sort of solved uh, textual entailment, even if you define that task in a nice IID in-domain kind of setup. Um, to come at this from one angle, we have, we have one task left where there's still a big gap. This Winograd schema task, um, we are still seeing a, a six-point difference between the state of the art and humans. And maybe that'll disappear if you scale up T5 by one more order of magnitude in data. But I think the, the more hand-wavy reason that I, I tend not to believe that we've sort of gotten there yet um, is that even the in-domain evaluations for tasks like um, textual entailment or question answering uh, or just the kinds of tasks we're dealing with in superglue, um, to get these tasks right consistently and for the right reasons, you need to be doing, um, you need to be doing a very good job at resolving coreference and managing entities, at parsing sentences, at just dealing with a lot of kind of intermediate structure that from the best evidence we have available, these models are only OK at. So it just it seems like likely that um, our, our data sets are either too biased or too noisy to really pick up on the, the weaknesses that these models tend to show on, on some areas. Hand wavy point, happy to get back to this at the end of the talk, but this is just the, uneasy, the uneasiness that I want to leave you with before I move on. So I'm going to detour into a side project that's only loosely related to this, but um, it's just something I, something I wanted to share. Um, it also deals very broadly with trying to take stock of the state of the field in this kind of classification-based language understanding universe. And this is, this is just getting into this line of work that's really exploded in the last couple of years of trying to analyze what big pre-trained neural networks know. And for now, I'm going to be just asking, why does BERT work so well? What does BERT know? We're talking entirely about BERT just because a lot of this work exploded around the emergence of the BERT model in particular. 
And analysis work lags modeling work by one publication cycle. And so BERT is sort of the latest thing to have been subjected to this full gauntlet of studies. So the kinds of, um, I want to just give a survey of kind of what we know. Give a, a few, I think, representative examples of claims that um, have been made in the literature credibly about what's inside BERT, what's doing, what BERT's doing, why it works. So one example that I was an author on, um, this work from Tenney et al., um, we showed that Elmo and Bert both learn essentially perfect features for part of speech tagging, that they, they really seem to be implicitly doing part of speech tagging about as well as it's possible to be doing that. That um, both models are learning pretty good features for both dependency and constituency parsing, but not perfect. And um, BERT is significantly better than ELMO. So one of the ways in which this seems to be a stronger model is in its ability to track, track sentence structure. And um, looking at co-reference, looking at sort of establishing links between pronouns and pronouns or pronouns and names, um, ELMO and BERT based really aren't getting off the ground. They're not extracting features that are at all usable for doing co-reference resolution better than chance. But BERT large is doing somewhat better than chance. It's starting to get off the ground. This is an interesting result because I think it, it gives us a clue as to, um, as to a sort of phase shift that we're seeing as these models get larger. And it, it seems pretty clear from what we've been seeing that as we're scaling up the model sizes and the data set sizes for these pre-trained models, um, these models are, are in some cases starting to pick up on more difficult or more abstract abilities than, than they had been at smaller scales. So a little clue to that. This survey, some of the other claims that have been made in the same sort of universe. Um, there's a follow-up paper um, to our paper by some of the same authors, but not me, that um, points out that lower layers of BERT express features for lower layer, ta lower level tasks. Uh, so part of speech knowledge is concentrated in low layers, and correspondingly, uh, knowledge of things like um, things like co-reference and semantic roles tend to be sort of in the higher layers of these big 12 or 24 layer networks. Um, there was a strange and interesting paper from, uh, from Hewitt and Manning showing that um, by looking at the geometry of the word and context representations coming out of BERT, you can show that, um, that these, are, these are sort of spatially arranged in a way that somewhat reflects syntactic structure, more evidence that these models are doing at least some implicit parsing. And um, using evaluations on hand-built test sets, kind of like our uh, pizza with olives, pizza with friends example. Um, another paper has shown that BERT relies pretty reliably, it relies quite often on very brittle sort of syntax unaware heuristics when doing a lot of these tasks like textual entailment. Um, these models will, will say, oh, if there's a str good string overlap between the, the first sentence and the second, that's a good clue to, to some label. Um, but again, some evidence of one of these phase shifts, uh, the larger BERT model, Again, same model, same training data, just more parameters and more layers, uh, is relying on these heuristics much less. So these are sort of claims that have been tossed around. I think they're basically reasonable, but I want to throw doubt on all of these. Um, I think there's, there's not necessarily anything wrong with how we're doing analysis, but there's something wrong about exactly these four slides that I think goes beyond just my talk. So uh, probing studies loosely defined, this is sort of how I'm referring to the kinds of results that I just presented, um, are becoming a very common tool for trying to make claims about what models like BERT know. The experimental designs that go into studies like these tend to make a number of pretty strong assumptions about, um, about the models we're studying. To give a sort of fairly straightforward example, the edge probing methods that we use to make claims about how well these models know part of speech or um, parsing or co-reference was based on this assumption that if these models are, um, are implicitly doing something like part of speech tagging or co-reference resolution, that it should be possible to read that information off with a very small um, MLP model, essentially a linear model. And there's really no reason to believe that should be the case. It's not a crazy assumption, but it's not an obviously sort of valid assumption either. And so what we wanted to do is just go back and ask, if we pick one question that we're interested in about what these models know and sort of subject it to the full range of ways that we might ask this question, how consistent are the answers going to be? At least the sort of high level, what does BERT know kinds of answers that I was just giving on previous slides. 
So this is actually an odd paper. This came out of a, a ling linguistics PhD seminar in the spring, so hence the 14 first authors. Fun project to do. But anyway, um, we wanted to, to ask this, this one fairly narrow question that we thought we could operationalize very nicely, which is um, how well BERT uh, tracks NPI licensing. So NPIs, negative polarity items, are words like uh, any or ever in uh, this kind of usage. They don't contribute a ton to sentence meaning, but they're sort of a clue to how the, some sentence is structured because they're only allowed to appear uh, in, a, uh, in the scope of a particular set of linguistic operators, uh, most classically negation. So here you might have a sentence like, I see kids who are not eating any cookies. This means roughly the same thing as I see kids who are not eating cookies. But this word any is sort of a clue that you're in the scope of negation, that this part of the sentence is being negated. And you can't rearrange this um, to move any outside of the scope of negation. So I see any kids who are not eating cookies. You have a negation, but the negation doesn't scope over any. This sentence just sounds weird. It's not clear what that any means or what it's doing there. Um, this is a, a fairly complex phenomena. Sort of, there's a fairly complex set of rules that, that govern where these things can occur, but they're well studied. We have a pretty good command over where these things can show up in English. Um, these rules depend on long distance dependencies and fairly high level uh, syntactic structures. So this seems like something where it shouldn't be trivial for a language model to pick up on these phenomena. And so we wanted, to, we wanted to pick this as our question. The big picture question we're asking is, does BERT know where NPIs are licensed? So we're going to ask this a bunch of different ways. And I'm going to speed through a bunch of slides, just getting at this as many ways as I can. So one thing we sort of kept constant across all of our studies was one set of test data we're using to evaluate performance. Uh, we created nine test sets, each built around hand-built grammars that we set up to generate uh, sentences that were more or less topically coherent, that looked like English, and that in a controlled way did or did not have these NPI licensing violations. And we, these were written by linguistics PhD students, and then we, we validated each one of these grammars on Mechanical Turk to make sure that humans agreed with our judgment. So study number one. Let's try teaching BERT to do the acceptability judgment task to decide if a sentence is coherent English, and then test it on the acceptability and the sort of acceptability judgment task that's implicit in our data here. Seems like a reasonable way to do this kind of study. It's on par with how a lot of people use, say, textual entailment data, is training on a standard data set and then testing on a custom uh, domain specific test set. And here's what, so here's what we get. We train on COLA, uh, this data I mentioned earlier in the talk of kind of acceptability judgments from a variety of domains. We test on our new test set. We're essentially measuring accuracy. The metric I'm showing here is Matthew's correlation, which measures the same thing as accuracy, but just sets, um, sets random guessing at zero. So this, these results look fairly positive. Our simple bag of words baseline is, is essentially a chance. And BERT isn't doing perfectly, but it's doing fairly well. Uh, 0.76 correlation, that's, that's good, but not great. So we'll make a sort of, if we were to, to give the elevator pitch version of this result, or we were to say, picture how someone else might describe this result in their related work section citing our work, Someone might say that BERT knows a bit about NPI licensing, but it's not perfect. Let's try doing this study a slightly different way. Instead of using our general purpose training data, let's use domain specific training data and, and build a sort of more specialized train test split. So here what we'll do is we'll do a hold one out evaluation by environment. So we'll train our model, for example, on relative clauses and conditionals on lots of kinds of sentences that don't include negation. And then we'll test it on sentences that include negation. So we'll sort of teach it what it means to look for licensing violations, but it will have to already know whether negation is a valid licensor and how negation scope works. So we'll do this nice hold one out evaluation um, for, uh, for sort of training and testing, but we'll test with, again, the same data, the same metrics. Here the results look somewhat different. The um, BERT does a bit better in the setting, but our trivial bag of words model is suddenly able to pick up on what's going on. This is worrying. I think this small gap would reads as much more of a negative result. I think, again, if you were given the elevator pitch here, you'd say, BERT is really just above baseline. It's not doing anything very interesting here. BERT probably doesn't track scope that well. You can do things a different way. Um, it's very easy to organize this data we created into these minimal pairs, where you have two sentences that differ by a one-word edit, usually a one-word swap. Um, we think this is a reasonable way of isolating this phenomenon. Let's use a, a slightly stricter metric where in order to get an example right, you have to, to make the correct 
positive judgment for the positive example and the correct negative judgment for the, the related negative example. So you have to sort of recognize that this difference makes, it, makes a difference, as it were. So same, training, same two different training setups, same, uh, same test data set, just different formulation of the metric. The results this way look pretty much the same as before. And we could make sort of either of the same conclusion we made on the previous slide. This change doesn't change that much. But we could frame this a little bit differently. Again, same training setup, same test data. Let's just define a slightly different metric. Let's say, let's look at the probabilities that the model assigns to these sentences. How likely is sentence one to be acceptable? What's our, the sort of logic coming out of our classifier? And how likely is sentence two to be acceptable? And let's say the model gets an example right if it assigns a higher probability to the correct sentence. So this is the, the, the forced choice task. This is a common way of using these acceptability judgments in the linguistic literature. Plenty of precedent for it. It's slightly easier metric. Here, the results look a little bit different. Um, our baselines are high, but especially in this hold one out training environment, BERT is at ceiling. BERT is doing completely perfectly a, a correlation of, I think, something like 0.995. Um, here we have evidence that BERT is generalizing to meaningfully out of domain test data on a fairly sophisticated phenomena with perfect accuracy. I think here, if you were to give the elevator pitch, you'd say something very positive. BERT knows what it's doing. We can do this one more way. We can use BERT's language modeling heads to test it with no training data. I'm not going to go into much detail here. And here we get a more lukewarm result. We could also do a probing style study where we just ask which word positions are under the scope of a licensor rather than asking about acceptability. Here we get, again, a more lukewarm result. What I want to leave you with is just this point that um, it's fairly easy to put together studies that give you this, this variety of different conclusions. And I'm not arguing that any of these methods are wrong. These are all precedented. I, I would claim that if I sort of put some time into it, I could publish a study that included any one of these methods that these are all sort of sane and publishable and like recognized ways of doing analysis in the NLP literature. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think the only thing to worry about is just that when you distill the findings of these studies down to these sort of little high level snippets to this, these kinds of claims that are meant to be most useful in understanding kind of why BERT works and why it fails, what we should do next, that you tend to lose a lot of information that, that's quite important to actually, um, to actually drawing reasonable conclusions here. So that's where I'll leave that. That's the end of our, our little detour into meta Bertology land. Let me get, get back to the, the fun and weird part of the talk. So we're in this weird situation. Uh, it feels like there are plenty of big open problems in NLU, that even in this sort of sentence, sentence level or paragraph level, simple output space IID setting in English, in like this sort of easiest possible version of NLU evaluation, it really doesn't feel like we've solved it. It really doesn't feel like we've built robust human-like models for language understanding. But we've also maxed out all of the available test data sets. And it's sort of not clear that we've come up with that many new ones that we can kind of use to fill in the gap. Again, we tried to create superglue just at the beginning of, of this year, 2019. Um, we had to throw away most of the data sets that were proposed, many of, many of which looked legitimately hard when they were, when they were submitted. So it sort of seems like at this particular moment, our ability to build models and sort of scale up models and improve models is, is, um, is growing faster than our ability to build sort of correspondingly difficult evaluation sets. So what do we do? Do we give up and work on something else? I mean, sure, there are lots of other problems in NLP that are arguably more urgently important, but I still think this is a hard open problem that I'd like to work on. So how, how might we do that? One, one approach that's, that's been getting some mileage in this direction is to use something in the, fam something in the family of adversarial filtering to semi-automatically create data sets that are hard for state-of-the-art models. And to give, to give my rough caricature of, of this idea, you essentially take a data gener generation process, either an automatic process or a process with crowd workers that gives you test examples. And you discard the examples, or you increase your probability of discarding examples if the current state-of-the-art model gets this right. So for example, there was a, an implementation of this for collecting textual entailment data at Facebook recently where they asked crowd workers to write these sentence pairs for entailment. But they wouldn't let you click Submit. They wouldn't let you finish an example until you'd edit it to the point that Roberta would guess wrong. 
I think this is a really interesting source of data for training. This is a really good way of sort of finding examples that are right at this decision boundary of the model we're studying. It's probably a good, way, a good source of data for local hill climbing evaluation, for, for high parameter tuning, for sort of model development in a certain scope. But using this kind of method to build benchmarks, to build something like GLUE has me very worried. Because what we'd really like to say with something like GLUE is that this sort of linear scale, like the number that, the number that you're getting out is more or less monotonically associated with the ability we care about. That if you get better on this number, that means you're, you're for some reason or another doing better at the actual ability we're studying. And I think using adversarial filtering to create data for these kind of, um, of benchmarks for broad use creates a metric that's going to encourage you to build systems that are different from current state-of-the-art systems without necessarily being better. That um, you could wind up building systems that, are, that have different weaknesses that fail on a different set of corner cases than current models. Um, and that would cause them to score much better because you've created this, this evaluation that highlights the sort of error cases of the current state of the art. And I think there, there are ways to work around this. Um, you, can, you can sort of mitigate this to some degree by saying, we're going to keep generating data, and we're going to make data that's adversarial for all the models that we're considering. But I think getting this, getting this down to something that's sort of as usable as a nice public single number benchmark is, is going to be quite logistically tricky. There's another approach that feels like kind of a, a, a lighter weight version of this, this the same basic idea, which is to build some kind of gro growing benchmark. Um, so this was something that was pioneered more or less by um, the Build a Break, Shop, Break It workshop a couple of years ago, and I think is more recently being revived by this org benchmark for question answering that was recently proposed, I believe, from AI2, where the idea is you start with a test set that's built in a normal way. Um, people submit models, ideally in a form where you, where you can rerun those models after they've been submitted in a, on a central server. And you allow experts to just submit more test examples. That as people notice phenomena that seem like interesting phenomena to evaluate on, they can just upload, hey, here's a, here's a set of 1,000 new question answering questions that target some interesting phenomena that I think will be hard. If, humans, if, if human annotators agree that these questions are, are valid, that labels are right, you just add that onto the, training, the test set and rerun your tests. And so you kind of allow this benchmark to evolve to target interesting sort of corner cases as they're discovered. I think this, this feels like kind of a, it has similar risks to a lesser degree um, and similar logistical uh, complications to a lesser degree. Um, I think this is doable. I think this might be the, the most viable way forward right now. Um, but there is still some risk that will sort of drift away from the task we're trying to solve, that will wind up creating data through this process of having linguists actually write data sets that um, artificially focuses on things that the most popular styles of model um, get wrong, but don't necessarily represent the sort of underlying task that we're interested in. So it's a risky situation. Um, one more direction we could go is to restrict the task training sets uh, to focus on zero shot or few shot adaptation to new tasks, where you test on the kinds of test sets you already have, but you say, all right, you're only allowed to use um, you're only allowed to use 100 examples from each task at training, or 10 examples from each task. Or you're only allowed to use a description of what the task is and zero examples. Um, I think this is, this is interesting. This is likely to encourage us to build better models and better representations. I think this is something we should be doing. But I also think it's not quite the same thing. This is just a different problem we could be doing. Um, I think there's, there are still open problems in this sort of in the setting where you are allowed to, to create training data. I think that's a, a setting that sort of users of NLP and industry are often in, that academic users of NLP are often in, where you can afford to create 1,000 data, data points for your task. I think that's still not solved. And so I think kind of this feels like a detour. This feels like a, a, a separate way of looking at the problem that isn't quite what we started with. So worthwhile, but not quite the same thing. The last direction, and something that I think we as a field should ultimately do. This is probably this, this strikes me as sort of the safest way to go, and I credit uh, George Dahl at Google for for really um, sort of beating me over the head with this this point. Um, is just build really big, really high quality data sets. The idea is to try to build data cre data creation pipelines. I have no idea how we'll build these data creation pipelines, where we can get data sets that are reasonably difficult, that involve reasonably complex and subtle subtle reasoning, but where human annotators 
human annotators agree at a very high level, ideally at greater than 99%. Uh, so this would mean very carefully filtering out errors, but also very carefully filtering out any data points where judgments are subjective, or at least coming up with a way to, to, to incorporate that into your metric. The idea here would be, okay, you have, you have a million test examples. We're sure that 999,000 of those are right. Probably Roberta off the bat is going to get 95, 96% of those right, but you say, all right, we're not done until the long tail. We're not done until you're actually at human agreement. And I suspect that this will allow us to highlight a number of weaknesses of our model, but still do so in a way that is sort of drawn from some relatively neutral, relatively natural distribution that isn't artificially biased towards or away from the particular methods we're studying right now. So again, I don't know how we do this. It's likely any method that would accomplish this would be very slow, very expensive, and not guaranteed to work once you've put in the time and the money. But this does seem like kind of the, the only way to fully build an evaluation that matches the goal that we started with. So um, that's more or less where I want to leave us. I just want to flag one other related open question that I have no good ideas on um, that just seems, seems to fit in with the kinds of, of points I'm raising, which is that we included this, this metric for, um, for sort of the inclusion of social bias in the superglue benchmark, but we deliberately didn't um, include that as part of our average. We didn't include that as a single number we wanted to hill climb on. So that there's a serious risk that someone could easily tweak their model in a way that would make it look very good on exactly our metric of without actually improving on any other metric. And I think that's sort of a fair concern for any time you're, you're trying to isolate these, these sort of biased behaviors in model that's, that it's, um, it's both technically and sort of politically difficult to decide what to measure, um, or it's, it's politically, different to, to, politically difficult to decide what to measure, and it's technically difficult to measure it, make sure you're measuring it in a way that you can safely hill climb on. Make sure you're measuring it in a way that if we, get, if we build models that score better on some, some benchmarks, that they're actually less likely to make biased decisions on future data on unknown tasks. Um, I think it would be valuable to find a way to do this. Um, I think putting out benchmarks like this has been a good way of sort of spurring progress on problems, but I think we have not yet figured out how um, we might do so. Anyway, what's next for evaluation? Sort of what do we do after glue and superglue? I've thrown out some rough ideas of where I can see the field going, but ultimately, I don't know. We're in a weird position. I don't claim to have any good answers. Uh, thanks for coming. These people gave me money. So um, I have two related comments, but maybe we can start with uh, some comments about the adversarial filtering slide, because um, there may have been, I, I realized that the name adversarial filtering and also how it was some of the prior work, including ours, were presented in the past might have given this impression that we really only keep the hard ones and throw out all the easy ones, which might actually represent really good uh, problem definition. And in fact, that's not the case in the sense that um, the way we think about it, at least I personally think about it, is that um, a lot of our data sets are over representing some cases, we don't know whether that's necessarily easy cases or not, but there are overpopulation of the very similar problem instances over and over again. And then um, some version of these adversarial filtering algorithms are keeping them, but at a lower level, so that it's a little bit more even now. So basically, reducing the head distribution and yeah. trying to make the data set a little bit more, a little bit more toward the tail distribution line. But, there's a limit to it in the sense that it cannot generate new data points, a lot more new tail distribution data points, mm -hmm. and it can only reduce the overrepresentation of the head. And then uh, the question about whether, so you know, in, in the slide you asked whether um, these data sets can lead to better model, uh, probably not, they're different but not better. So I think that this depends on where you want to perform better. If you actually want to perform better on the original glue, really not a good idea to filter anything out. It's the best to use exact same biased training data yes. that resembles the tested distribution. But we have new experiments that uh, we find that on many other diagnostic data sets or adversarially constructed data sets, the models trained on um, filtered data uh, compared to the original data does do better. So 
I think it's somewhat surprising or not surprising results depending on how one's expectation may have been. So I would say that the verdict is still yet to be determined. I mean, probably we should look at these things much more carefully, but I appreciate like how you basically suspect anything that's happening in the field. So on that note, um, I had a really fun workshop to attend at ICCB in which Alyosha Efros at Berkeley, he's a hot shot in computer vision who's anti-data set. And um, uh, I, I didn't agree with everything that he said in his talk, but I love this talk so much. If you ever see his name, uh, go check it out. It's really great. But one thing he said was something like the following. The reason why he doesn't like supervised training is because um, it's almost like, you know how students who didn't come to your classes uh, but can download the previous year's exam questions and then kind of, you know, remember for this kind of question, this kind of answer is the right answer. So even if you try to change the problem a little bit because you recycle very similar style of exam writing, students can perform really well without learning the true, you know, having true understanding about the material. And then this relates to your earlier comment about whether any of these models actually learn a meaningful linguistic phenomena like a core reference resolution well enough to solve any of this. And then yet another really, um, sorry, like I, 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 I need to also um, cite Matt Gardner's a workshop talk at the MLP in which he also raised a similar question that even if one were to generate really a lot of high quality data for reading comprehension that's really, really hard, and you know, everybody agrees human agreement might be really hard. Can a model actually learn to really comprehend the text when the learning is set up as just like you know lots of curators? So these are like you know just question like, are we actually doing this right? Like, is there a hope to just create large scale QA data sets and then try to learn something? Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to respond to at least some of that, and I'm happy to talk more in person. Um, yeah, so I, I, I very much like one point, which is just that the, the original data distribution that we're starting with is often going to be broken and broken and heavily influenced by exactly how we collected the data, and also not necessarily reflect the thing we care about at all, that this, this, the argument against an adversarial filtering style approach is strongest if you believe that the, the original data distribution is actually somehow valid, which is usually wrong. I guess I'm still, I'm still nervous though. I think there's kind of this burden of proof on, on using these methods that even if you're just adjusting the distribution of an existing data set, um, that if you're, using, if you're using a set of models that is not, if you're using a set of models that is any way biased, that is not like, a true sample, a true uniform sample from the set of all possible models, whatever that would mean, that you're, um, that you are somehow sort of artificially disadvantaging some classes of models over others, and that that is, that you sort of need to quantify that and show and show the degree to which that's that that, the, that that's the case, in order to really make a convincing case that you have a sort of fair, neutral evaluation. And so, it's still putting up a, a sort of benchmark style leaderboard. This does make me nervous. Um, yes, but I'm 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 curious also about the burned all down and give up on training sets. I think there's that is that is another another page we could put here, and there there likely be very interesting things to say. Um, yes. You said a few times, are we really evaluating to capture the thing we really care about? And I'm wondering, how do you articulate what it is that we really care about in this context? That's so I. I I'll make I'll make a I'll make a slightly jet lagged attempt um, at this. I'm not sure I it, I can really do a great job, but um, through all of this, I'm taking a, a taking a view that I think is sort of fairly grounded in applied NLP. I'd like to say, all right, we have we have some set of tasks we'd like to solve that seem intuitively to require dealing with syntax, semantic, pragmatic, some degree of common sense that seem solvable in principle by machines. Um, we would like to build models that perform at a human level on any data that is consistent with our intended definition of the task. That if we're building a sentiment classification model, we can more or less write down what sentiment means. We can sample, sample a test set that we think represents that reasonably well, but we want to say, 
any data you throw at me that feels like a an example of an example of sentiment, um, our model should be agreeing with should tend to agree with humans to the extent that humans agree with one another. And so I think even for that relatively uh, relatively applied, relatively sort of current status quo friendly definition, we're sort of not there yet. So I liked how you used uh, human performance trickers to, to sort of calibrate or interpret the, the model performances. And I'm wondering if you could talk about like what do you what how meaningful you think the gap is between like human tricker performance and expert performance and the truth and like are those gaps is that is that a real limitation to to progress or is it just noise is it I don't know yeah so I guess I we wanted to have those human performance numbers have just some idea of like. When to, when to give up, when to abandon hope, when we're like, should be pretty sure we've solved the data sets. But they're, they're a very blunt tool. I don't think we should accord them too much importance. Um, for no reason, sort of, yes, these are, these are crowd workers making these decisions. They're, they're not likely to be putting really substantial effort into the task. We're not adjudicating dis disagreements. So there's kind of, even if we assume that they are doing the job, um, there is a quite a bit of noise there that, that crowd worker performance is not going to be Sort of base error is not going to be like the best possible performance in the data set. Um, I think, sort of, working with working with experts who are who are given sort of very long time limits and who know the exact process that generated the original data, you can do better. For the COLA benchmark, we sort of nicely saw this. We saw the performance of uh, we saw performance of um, Crowd workers on our metric was maybe 65 points. The performance of a single linguistics PhD student judging the data was 75. And uh, five linguistics PhD students in a room with a pizza trying to argue it out were maybe 80. Um, but again, I think this is just a very blunt tool. It's meant to give us a rough clue of sort of where we're maxing out these data sets. Um, yeah, I don't know if that quite gets at the question. Yeah. Are we uh, assuming there's bias in the data? The model's probably better at getting that than the people. Yes, yes, yes. That's, that's a very good point. Yeah, this is where I think. If the data generation process was doesn't quite match the just abstract specification of the data, um, then models will pick this up. We saw this especially for the Quora data. The Quora data actually came out of this long, multi-step, semi-automatic moderation process inside Quora, the company. They they distributed no documentation about where this data came from, and so our our MTurk workers were trying to learn to reverse engineer this process using our description of what we thought they were doing and twenty examples, and they they didn't do a good job, and even I think even Elmo is basically at human level on that. Yeah. Just curious on the thread of English only so far. Um, are there other data sets like this benchmark data sets in other languages that are highlighting other phenomena that perhaps haven't been captured on the menu here for English? Um, I don't know that well. So the what there is, there is a there's a Chinese glue data set that came out uh, or sort of benchmark that came out recently that I think is a fairly direct clone of this. Uh, the documentation is in Chinese, which I can't read, so I don't know exactly what the scope of task is. I know it's a different it's a different distribution of task. Um, but also something that's it's a little bit less related, but that's really interesting that's been emerging in the last year or two, is the arrival of a bunch of cross-lingual benchmarks. These are things like X and Y that we've been involved with, or uh, X quad or quad. Not sure how to pronounce this. That came out recently. There are a few data sets where. You are the setup is you're you're asked to train on English language data, and test on twenty or thirty other languages, and just it's expected that as part of your model, you have some way of mapping language meaning into some language agnostic representation that allows you to just train on English and test on something else. And I think probably the the craziest result in NLP this year is that this actually kind of works, and um, these these. Benchmarks are getting better. The data sets are getting better. And we're actually building models that do a decent job at that. But it's not quite getting your question because we're, we're not necessarily doing a good job of focusing on phenomena that are specific to non-English languages. Okay. Let's thank Jonathan. Right. Thanks again.